Shri Balaji, sir. Hi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are live now. Uh, we can start, sir. You can mute the YouTube. Uh, YouTube thing you can mute. Otherwise, it will be echo for you. Okay. Uh, okay. Just give me one minute. Uh, so, firstly, I think, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Aniruddham Ganesh Raman, uh, final year BSc student at Chennai Mathematical Institute. Uh, I am the TA for the Haskell course, which is currently being offered by Professor S.P. Suresh. Um, so, uh, again, welcome to the first uh, live session. Um, so, what I have planned for today is maybe like give you a brief overview about Haskell. So, starting off with what is Haskell, why we use it, and some point out some features of Haskell. And in addition, go to where in the real world is Haskell used? Is it, is it really being used? Those are some of the questions which I want to answer. And later, maybe I'll, go, I'll give you a quick executive summary of the course, which we have covered so far. And I'll maybe go through some of the exercises, uh, which uh, I found to be uh, slightly more challenging than the others, or which may bring out some nice uh, conceptual aspects. And I'll also answer some interesting questions from the discussion forum on the live chat, even though they've been answered on the discussion forum. Uh, I can add in a little bit more words here. And uh, if need be, then we can definitely go over uh, some questions from the assignment. So um, uh, do feel free to type in your uh, questions in the YouTube chat. I will monitor them uh, frequently. Uh, so, okay, so let's let's get started. So what is Haskell? That's the primary question we, we hope to answer now, uh, though we are almost, I think, four weeks into the course. Uh, so Haskell is what is called a functional programming language, right? So a functional programming language is something as opposed to imperative programming language, which most of us start learning of it. So a functional programming language, what it does, it uses functions to solve problems. Whereas when it comes to an imperative programming language, you specify the steps that should be executed in order to solve problems. So as you may have seen in your experience um, uh, in writing programs in Haskell, so there are functions literally everywhere. So for Fibonacci, Fibonacci number is a function, right? Fn, F0 is one, F1 is one, and Fn is Fn minus one plus Fn minus two. And say you want the 27th Fibonacci number, you just query F27, and that gives you the output, right? But what if you were to do this in, say, uh, an, in, an imperative programming language, say, like Java, C++, or C, et cetera? So in this case, you would have to write some sort of, you would have to create an array or a list and uh, write a for loop, and all these things is what you want to do, right, in, in, the, in the imperative programming case. So this is the main contrast between functional and imperative. Functional programming uses functions, as the name suggests. And imperative programming, you need to sequentially specify what steps you have to follow, right? So this naturally means that in an imperative programming language, the order in which you execute your steps is going to be extremely important. But that's not the case in the case of a functional programming language. Order is not that important, right? Even though there are there is some uh, constraints on the order as well, but it's not as uh, demanding as when it comes to the imperative programming language case, right? Um, so one place where I found particularly engaging to read was uh, the Geeks for, Geek Ar Geeks for Geeks article on functional versus uh, imperative programming language. So uh, do check that out if uh, you're really curious about what uh, the what more differences are there between functional and imperative. So if something still strikes you, then you can definitely reach out to us in the discussion forum. Yeah. And this is like a little bit about what What's special about Haskell in some sense, right? So another uh, uh, language which comes close to being a functional programming language is Python, right? But let's not get into that a little bit because that's going to deviate off our main focus, right? And another key feature of Haskell is what is called laziness. That's particularly my favorite feature. Um, so what uh, the uh, what uh, characterizes laziness is that it doesn't do anything until it's absolutely necessary, right? So just like how all of us do not do our homeworks until it's one day before the deadline. So it's just the Haskell works also in the same way, right? So things things are pushed until the very last minute, until you're absolutely, it's absolutely necessary to be computed, only then will you do it, right? So uh, a very nice example of this is seen when you calculate, say, the list of prime numbers, right? Um, so I'll frequently switch between sharing my screen and uh, uh, just uh, on audio. So uh, do bear with me for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you just, uh, Steve Balaji, sir, can you just confirm if you can see my screen? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, 
So, right. So, let's start with uh, what uh, what we want to talk about is this very nice property called laziness of uh, Haskell. Right. So, uh, you may have seen that you can talk about the list of all prime numbers. Right. So, in math, that's a natural thing to talk about. That's the list of consider the set of all prime numbers. Right. But what uh, when, when it comes to uh, when it comes to a computer doing it right so you know that the list of all the number of prime numbers is infinite right um, so talking about the list of prime numbers is something which requires delicate care but haskell being lazy allows us to do all sorts of crazy things right so uh, i'm not sure if this is introduced to you yet but so you can write multi line uh, commands in haskell in ghci itself using this colon and flower brace, right? You can enclose your code in colon and flower brace and you can write multiple lines of code. Uh, I'm not sure if this has been introduced to you yet, but yeah, you can definitely look at this, right? Okay, so let's just call primes to be the list of primes, right? So primes is of the type integer, right? It's a list of integers, right? Now, how do I define? This is what we want to define this list of primes, right? So you may have seen what is called the sieve of Eratosthenes, right? So what the sieve of Eratosthenes does is, I'll just uh, erase this now, uh, later. Right. So you have you start with all these numbers, right? You start by uh, canceling out all the multiples of two, right? You leave two and you start canceling all multiples of two, right? So two is uh, two is there, four is gone, six is gone, eight is gone. 10 is gone, 12 is gone, and so on, right? Next, you come back to the startup list. You leave two, you leave three. You start by canceling out the multiples of three, right? So six would have been canceled, but it's already, it's a multiple of two, so it's canceled, right? Um, so you cancel nine, you cancel, uh, 12 would have been canceled, and the next number you cancel would be 15 and so on, right? So similarly, you continue doing all this, right? And uh, the sieve of Eratosthenes, what the procedure says, and it's uh, rather uh, an interesting fact to check, is what says that uh, what is left will be the set of all prime numbers, right? If you uh, one is always uh, that doesn't matter, so one is prime composite, neither prime nor composite, that's okay, right? So, uh, I think a safer statement to say would be if you start with that, then all what you'd be left with is a set of all non composite numbers, right? So, let's try implementing this in Haskell, that's what we want to do now. So, uh, we, we define a function called sieve, sieve does exactly what the sieve of Eratosthenes does, right? So let we say primes to be receiving the list two dot dot. Recall again, two dot dot is just two, three, four, all the way up to infinity, right? Now, what do I know? I, I don't know what C is, right? So I have to define that, where I'll define C to be uh, C of a list X colon X is, is uh, what should I do? I should take the first element, right? Remember I took two, but I should leave out the other multiples of two, right? So what I'll do is I'll save the list y such that uh, this y is in the tail of the list. So this syntax is particularly nice. It's something like very much resembling math, right? Mod, uh, what should it say? Uh, I think it should say mod x y is not equal to zero. So, right, oh, mod, okay, I made a mistake. Sorry about this. Right, so this is what the sieve of Eratosthenes does, right? So if you do this, you get um, uh, the list of all possible uh, prime numbers. Now, if you want, you can check with the bang bang operator. This is the bang bang operator. Now, let's see if this works. Right. So, uh, okay, I think I've made a mistake. Just give me one minute. Right. Yeah, okay, sorry. I, I, okay, I, oh, mod yx not equal to zero. It should have been. Uh, let's just do this one thing. Okay. So, uh, right, okay. So let's 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 do this one thing now. Uh, you, what you can do right now is you can take the bang bang operator of the primes list, and you can you can ask it to compute the twenty thousandth prime or what whatever prime number you want, right? So you can ask your uh, Haskell to compute all that. Now another thing which is interesting 
is you can ask uh, Haskell to tell you how much time it has taken. You can ask Haskell to tell you how much time or how much memory it has taken to compute a particular thing, right? So the command for that is the following, colon set plus S is going to tell you how much time and how much memory uh, uh, the computation has taken. And colon set plus T is going to return what the type of your output argument is, right? So for example, if I enter five, it's just going to be a number, right? Five is just a number and something took, and this is the amount of memory it takes, right? So similarly, you can define it for a particular function also. So for example, let's start with the Fibonacci function usual, right? Fib zero is one, Fib one is also one, and Fib n is Fib n minus one plus Fib n minus two. Ah, okay, this is correct, right? So you, you defined a function fib which takes in a number and gives out another number, right? So now you can ask for numbers like what is the, uh, hopefully this doesn't, let's say fib nine, right? Uh, let's say fib 20, now let's experiment, right? So this is something like which also highlights one more feature of Haskell, which is this is an extremely strong computational tool, right? So Haskell is an extremely strong computational tool, mainly attributed to the fact that it has a lazy evaluation, right? Now, another feature is in Haskell is that of uh, what is called pattern matching, right? So what pattern matching does is that uh, uh, you, you can define functions nicely, which is on the go, you can define functions, and there's something like, which, which are like rather very intuitive definitions of functions, right? So for example, uh, uh, let's consider the function, which is the exclusive or, right? Uh, let's just say XOR, right? Exclusive or, or the XOR function, right? So um, what do we want it to behave as? We want, uh, we want XOR of true and, and uh, true to be false. And we want if it is, uh, let's say false and false, also to be false. Right, and if it's true false, we want it to be true. And if it is false true, then also we want it to be true, right? So this is what the XOR is, right? So this is something in which you can, you can define the function case by case, right? You can say XOR of true true is true, XOR of false false is false. You can say XOR of true false is true and XOR of false true is true, right? Now, but uh, another nice feature of Haskell is that it allows you to treat functions as objects itself. So what I mean by that is you can simply write XOR is equal to not equal to, right? So let's just go over this again. So uh, XOR takes two inputs as function, right? So XOR is of type uh, bool, arrow, bool, arrow, bool, right? recall that these two bools are the input and the last bool is the output right so it takes two bools as input one bool as output and all what it checks if you see from these cases here is that the two inputs are not equal to each other that's exactly what xor checks so you can simply write xor is equal to not equal to right so that's that's a really key feature of uh, um, uh, haskell right um, okay, and so this is a little bit about the XOR function, right? And uh, and another uh, nice thing about Haskell is that you have what is called the list comprehension, right? So you can um, uh, there there are all possible ways in which you can define list, and from there you you can use list in whatever ways you want, right? Um, so, for example, if I were to say, um, let's see. Okay. So, for example, if I were to say, I can I can do something like the list of all even numbers, right? Let's just say my even is the list of all x such that x in uh, it should be one dot dot where mod x two is not equal to zero. Sorry, mod x2 is equal to zero, right? That's that's the list of all even numbers, 
right and now i can ask for something like my even and recalls is a bang bang operator bang bang operator it uh, extract out the element at that particular position of the list right so uh, it's showing 8 because in haskell the indexing starts from 0 right so 0 uh, 2 4 6 that's uh, 0 1 2 3 that's what it goes so the fourth element in r words is 8 right and another thing what you have another nice feature of haskell is, is what is called the type classes right so so for example if you were to calculate the length of a list right so length of i'd say 1 2 3 is going to be 3 right and length of another list say uh, length of if i say something like um uh, true false true right this is still going to be 3 right so uh, all what matter is not that um uh, it, it, what matters is not the uh, 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 what is inside the list but so that's one thing which is being captured by uh, haskell right so uh, the type of length it's just going to be uh, ignore the foldable let's say the default type the foldable i think we'll study it a bit later right so you can take a list of any element a uh, list of uh, any type and it will give you an integer as an output right that's that's what is being uh, that's something which is what is called type class right now uh okay so uh but next next question is where do we run haskell so running haskell requires what is called a ghci right glasgow haskell compiler and the i stands for interactive that is you can uh, interact with ghci in the sense that you uh, ask in you ask it a query and it gives you an output right um so that's that's about where you run haskell now this is the fun part so where and why are we using haskell right so firstly as i mentioned Haskell is a really good computing tool. It has an excellent computing speed, right? So as I remark, you can use the colon set plus t um, to see how fast the uh, colon set plus s to see how fast uh, the computation speed is and how much memory it has taken, right? Uh, colon set plus t is for the memory uh, uh, the type input, right? Now uh, coming to the uses of Haskell. So this was one of the questions in the discussion forum. Um, so haskell in, in is is currently used in some products of facebook so i read it somewhere uh, so i do not know much about it but uh, it's uh, i read it that it's being used in some pro, uh, some products of facebook like some anti spam programming etc right and some some product of barclays bank also uses and some maybe minor feature of nasa is also being is also using uh, haskell right um so but uh, once again like i'm not entirely aware of how exactly this is being used so that may be like some fun thing to uh, read about so i'm sure you can find uh, uh, sources online for that right um so but nevertheless haskell you must agree is like a really fun language to play with the syntax is very easy so it's just more or less math. the the belongs to is just a less than and a hyphen and the set is just a parenthesis instead of a, a square bracket and all that right so the syntax is rather fun to play with and it's a really good uh, beginner uh, language right so you can definitely do that and you can go to great extents with this language also right and my favorite point always is that haskell is lazily typed so that cannot get better so all it does is what is necessary to be done right um so uh, but uh, indeed it's like a sad point that is not as popular as uh, java or python but that's okay and right so finally what's the key takeaway is that it's a nice and easy language to start with right so uh, let's let's do that so uh, let's begin with like maybe like a rough overview of what uh, uh, the course is all about uh, okay uh, is it necessary to give parenthesis um, okay i think i missed where it was uh, amit if you're still here it would be nice if you could type the entire question um I'll, i'll take a look at it okay so let's let's maybe like give a brief overview of whatever happened in the course so far and throughout i'll be like uh, interspersing it with like some exercises or answer some assignment uh, uh, give some exercise problems or maybe answer some assignment questions or answer some questions which come came up in the chat right so i'll i'll be doing this uh, uh, throughout so let's see so what did we start with in week one we started with what functions are and what types are right 
So uh, there is not much to uh, elaborate in this. And next, we also saw how to run Haskell pro programs, which is like uh, uh, starting how to use GHCI, right? So uh, GHCI is a really fun place to play with. So that's something like it you definitely should, right? And the most important concept which uh, was introduced in the first uh, uh, week was what is called cutting, right? So cutting is a really cool concept wherein you have, if you have a multivariate function, that is, if you have a function which takes multiple values, right? Uh, give me, I'll just switch to sharing my screen. Right. So if you have a function which takes multiple values, right? Let's say f, x, y, z, right? So for example, let's say f, x, y, z, let's define it into x, y, uh, I should do it. Uh, x into y into, uh, let's say y plus three into z. Okay, hopefully it doesn't shout at me. Yes, it's good. Okay, so now what currying says is that if you can, you can define, you can reduce the number of, uh, you can gradually decrease the number of variables, right? Uh, so what I mean by that is you can define a function, uh, let's say g x y, right? And that's just going to be f x, uh, you can, uh, let's say d z, d z is going to just be f x, uh, let's say f 2, 3 and z. Oh, sorry, this should be f, right? So you, can, you can define such a function like this. This is what currying allows you to do. So what it's saying is in some sense, like if, uh, say, if you've taken a course in uh, multivariable calculus, so like you can see some similarity with the uh, Fubini's theorem uh, for uh, multi, uh, integration of functions from R into R, right? So if, if you're curious to see like a little bit more about it, so in fact, uh, John Cook has a rather nice article on the connection between uh, this is not complete in some sense, but uh, like kind of points to a nice connection between um, currying and uh, Fubini's theorem, right? So that's that's something like which which was uh, which uh, I found particularly interesting, right? And so there was one one uh, coming to one uh, question in the uh, assignment, um, right? So there was this one particular question in the assignment, which uh, uh, I'm not sure about the question number, but uh, let's uh, let's see. Okay, so you have a function f x y z, and all it says is that it is equal to uh, x greater than equal to y equal to not of zero less than equal to z and and z less than equal to y. Right. So this is what the function says, and it says uh, how many values. Uh, how many pairs x comma y does for how many pairs x comma y does f x y three be false for x between minus two and two and y between minus three and three both inclusive right so uh, there was one there was one question about this so maybe i'll just elaborate a little bit on this right so i'll not answer the entire question but this is how you should think of it right so f x y z all what that's measuring is uh, it returns true if x is greater than or equal to y and if one of these is false, right? So remember, this is a not of an and, right? So if one of these is false, then this is going to be false. So that that is uh, essentially what you should check, right? So take take you you want f x y three to be false, right? So if that means you want this to not be equal to this part, right? So that means if this is true, then you want this part to be false, right? So which is the same as if you want this to be true, then this is true. Or if this is false, then this is also false, right? So go over these cases. What, what happens when this is true, right? If this is true, then x can x should be at least y. So uh, check the number of possibilities and intersect it with the number of possibilities in this. That is, z should be non-negative and also that z should be less than or equal to y, right? So this is the cases when both of them are true. And similarly, if this is false, x if x greater than or equal to y is false, which is x is less than y, then this also should be false, right? And you know how to take a false of two conjug uh, a conjugate of two statements, right? So that is what this question was about, right? And next, what did we come to? Um, uh, after this, we came to uh, in week two. Uh, what we saw was this extremely important concept of tuples, li lists and tuples, right? So 
so they're rather extremely elementary but um they're, they're very much uh, uh, important right um so there was one one nice question from the uh, discussion area again uh, 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 about asking about the difference between uh, lists and uh, tuples right so remember that lists uh, list can take a single type right so you can, you cannot have something like a list of say one comma bool comma something right uh, what i mean is you cannot have something like this is not valid right but on the other hand this is valid right the latter is an example of a tuple and the former is a list right so list should have only values of single type while whereas a tuple can have multiple types right um a uh, list is by denoted by square bracket and a tuple is denoted by uh, a, 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 the parenthesis right now the nice part about lists are that it can be uh, it is editable in some sense i'm just loosening the terminology here that is like you can add more elements to the list and and so on right but a tuple in what in what is called is immutable right um so that's that's just one one uh, so there are like both pros and cons to using lists and tuples right and the key point here is that tuples have a fixed number of elements right so for example if i want to try, if i want to get the type of the previous element right so recall again that it is it is going to refer to the uh, last uh, output right so uh, if i ask the type of it colon t it is going to give me the type of the last thing which is this right so it is just one is a number and true is a boolean if i ask what is the type of one true and a this is going to shout heavily at me right because this is not even a valid list and i'm asking the type of it right this does not make sense right okay so but both of them are nevertheless uh, useful in their own ways right so for example if you want a tuple right so tuples uh, the main use is that you can use it to see something like um uh like say if you want the details of a particular student right so say you want something like the name i'll just put my name here and say if you want something like uh, the age i don't know how many uh let's say you want this and you want say some roll number some right and if you want all this and say i've passed or failed right let's say two is passed and false is failed so this is something which can be done in a ah, sorry i should put a quote here right so this is something which i can do as part of a tuple right but i cannot do it in a list right so now uh and re remember again that now that i brought in a string here strings are just lists right strings are just lists of characters right so uh now now like since you are introduced to like lists and tuples you can do all sorts of crazy stuff like uh you can think about what happens to a list of lists and what happens to a list of tuples what happens to a tuple of lists and what happens to tuples of tuples right so like try to see as i said in the discussion forum also uh try to see which one of these is like the most restrictive in some sense and put it in quotes which is the most restrictive and which is the least restrictive right so these are some things which you can uh, think about right and so there are like multiple ways to manipulate lists so i'll just list down the functions which you can use and uh, from there you can uh, take it up right so head is a head is a function which you can use to manipulate list uh, which returns the first element tail returns everything but the first element as a list right and then there comes a cons operator cons is just used to add elements to the list right and then you have the map operator right what does map do map it takes a function and a list right in and it applies the function to each and every element of the list right let's just see that as an example let's say i want to multiply by 7 right so map i can map into 7 into this list 1 10 and every single element of this is being multiplied by 7 right and similarly i can ask for what is the length of it right uh, hopefully it should give me to yes it does right so uh, then i can concat two lists right uh, let's say concat i can do say 1 2 3 and oh okay concat is i'd rather do this right so it just merges the two lists uh, together right and then you have this bang bang operator 
that is if i say it bank bank is three it's going to give me a four right that is it returns the third position and then you can also do something like reverse the list right i say right i, I get four three two one right so a nice exercise since you have seen foldal and foldar uh, a nice exercise would be to try writing reverse in terms of either one a fold l or fold r whichever you think is uh, easier right uh, now uh, coming to tuples there are like two major functions which are just first and second right so first is uh, all what first does is take a tuple of two elements and returns the first and all what second does is take a tuple of two elements and returns the second right that's evident from uh, the type def type definition which we have here right so the, but uh, coming back to lists the main point is that uh, on lists your induction is on the structure of the list right so as you may have seen uh, the definitions for reversing a list etc so the way you define it is such that you uh, induct it on the structure of the list you pull the first element put it to the end you take the second what would have been the second element put it to the end again right so in this in this way you reverse the list right so uh, think about what the statement means uh in list you mo mostly induct on the structure right and then uh, coming back to functions you have certain nice functions also right so you have something like take so what does take do so it takes say uh, i want the first 10 natural numbers right so you take the first 10 natural numbers right and suppose i do i want everything but the first 10 natural numbers right so you drop the first 10 natural numbers i better be ready to kill this yes Right? So you dropped everything but the first 10 uh, natural numbers, right? And next, uh, there is one question which came up. And uh, what is the difference between take while and filter, right? That's an excellent question. Um, so let's see what take while does first, right? So let's see, take while, uh, let's say of something, say greater than five of one dot dot, okay? What is it going to return? It's going to give an empty list. So what take while does is it's going to search for the list until the condition, the Boolean condition here is, uh, has become false, right? So in our case, the very first element is not greater than five. So it just abruptly stops, right? But what filter does, it's going to take all the elements which are greater than five in the list, right? If I put the same thing, filter greater than five of one dot dot, right i'll just put uh maybe just to take 10 of this right so recall again that, uh let's put uh take this bit by a bit so filter greater than five is going to give me all the elements in this list one dot dot which are greater than five right and of that what am i doing i'm taking only 10 right this dollar in some sense you can think of it as a bracket which starts here and ends at the very end right so that's how you should think of this uh, dollar right so dollar is just uh, used to reduce clutter so it becomes uh, really very messy to deal with many many brackets right so a dollar kind of simplifies like right and uh, coming up next what else do you have so remember i uh, told you that a list is a uh, uh, string is just a list of characters right so that begs for uh, a little bit more about uh, characters so what you do is let's just start off by importing data.char. That's just a, a package which contains all nice functions to manipulate characters, right? So the two main uh, character, the two main of uh, the functions that you have here are character which returns, which is of type. Three. So what this means is that each character has a unique Unicode character, a unique Unicode, right? So what the character chr function does is it takes the Unicode uh, encoding of a particular, uh, of uh, it takes a random Unicode encoding and gives out the character associated with that particular encoding. And you have another function which is odd. What odd does is it takes the character and gives out the Unicode encoding, right? So these are, speaking in some sense, they're the inverses of each other, right? Okay, so this this is like a little bit about uh, characters and uh, uh, strings and tuples and lists, right? So uh, maybe like a, maybe a good point here would be to uh, give an exercise, right? So I'll just switch to Notepad. That's a bit easier. So 
So I just remove this. Okay. So, uh, right. so we have, uh, let's uh, maybe a, a nice exercise would be, so let's say N is fixed. Okay. Let's say N is 20. Okay. So now uh, write a function to compute the norm of a given point in Rn, right? So let's say X1, there's a point in Rn, okay? Now I write a function that computes the norm of this function, right? I recall again that this is given as a tuple, right? So what you have to do is, uh, uh, norm is basically what it means is the distance between zero and this point, right? So in some sense, like if you have a tuple x1, right? So uh, everything is given. So it won't be given as dot, but x1, x2, x3 up to x20, everything is written. So what this computes is the square root of x1 square plus x2 square xn square okay this is what you have to write a function to compute it right so the key part is how do you get x1 and x2 right you're in you're given an input as a tuple right you're not given uh, like n different inputs right so uh, try writing a function let's let's just fix n let's say n is 3 okay and uh, try writing a function for this right so this is the first question and another question which you can try is uh, this is a little bit far fetched but what you can possibly do is say you are given three points, right? Uh, in R cube, let's say x, y, and z are three points in R cube, right? So what does that mean? Each of x, y, z is a tuple, right? So x is some x1, x2, x3, and y is some y1, y2, y3, and z is some z1, z2, right? So write a function which checks if these form a triangle or not, right? So what I mean by that is if you say I is a, a triangle. Uh, uh, write a function triangle, which is uh, which takes in input. Let's say x1, x2, x3 as a tuple, and y1, y2, y3 as another tuple, and z1, z2, and z3 as another tuple, and gives out either true or false. Right? False if it is not a triangle. That is, the points are collinear or true if uh, it does form a triangle, right? So try writing a function. So once again, the key thing you need to use is triangle inequality, right? So for triangle inequality, use the earlier uh, function which you defined here, right? So uh, yeah, so uh, maybe these, these may be like two nice exercises to think about it, okay? Um, let's see, okay. So next, uh, like maybe uh, the summary of what happened in week three, um, so week three, we started with uh, uh, how computation is just rewriting, right? So that is what we started with. And so then we went to what is uh, called polymorphism, which we discussed earlier, right? Functions can have uh, 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 multiple types. So for instance, like this length, right? So length has type list of integers, arrow integer, or list of say bool arrow integer, or list of strings arrow integer and so on, right? So there are functions which have multiple types. And one more thing which we also saw earlier was that there are functions of higher order, right? That is with functions which take functions as input, right? So we saw in the example of currying that if you have a function f x y z is some x y plus y square plus z square something, right? So you can just split out one variable and use that as an input to your function f, right? So these are what are called higher order functions, right? And then ultimately, we saw this extremely important uh, list manipulation. So list manipulations, what are they again? So just two examples which we, I think, uh, discussed earlier was this map and filter, right? And finally, list comprehension is just uh, making the list, like we saw in the case of the, uh, my events list, right? And now, now comes uh, like kind of my favorite part, which is fold L and fold R, right? So this was like, uh, 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 this was not uh, easy to grasp in the first attempt, but uh, nevertheless, this is something which is extremely interesting, right? So let's start with uh, fold L and fold R now. So uh, all what fold L and fold R uh, 
uh, is meant to do is to uh, apply a function on a list and to get a particular value as an output, right? So that's that's what the object of a folder and folder is. But uh, maybe I'll just give you an example and let's see what happens. Right? So uh, fold. Uh, let's start with I think folder, right? So uh, what's the motivation for this, right? So as as uh, seen in one of your lectures. So say you want to calculate the sum of the elements of the list, right? So let's say the list is one, two, three, four, and five. You want to compute the sum of elements of this list, right? So what you want to do is one plus two plus three plus four plus five, right? And I might as well add in just a plus zero, right? So this is something which I'm uh, I'm interested in computing. And how do I do this? I do I take out the first element of the list, right? I add it to zero, right? Let's say I have an accumulator here, which is zero, right? So I take the first element of the list, I add it to zero, right? The accumulator becomes one, and the list becomes two, three, four, five, right? Next, I, I, in my accumulator, I have one. I take the first element of this list again, right? Which is two. I remove two here, and I add it to the accumulator. It becomes three, right? And next, I take this element here, and I add it here so that it becomes six, and I remove this element here again, and uh, I add it to this list so that it becomes 10. And if I remove this element, this is where the problem is, right? If I remove this element, I get a 15. But what do I do with this guy? I have no idea what to do with this, right? So here you assign what is called a default value, right? So whenever you encounter an empty list, you default it to take the value zero, right? So this is what is the motivation for uh, folder and folder. Right, so for example, so I'll just define folder and folder, and from there maybe we can talk a little bit more about it. Right, uh, so uh, so uh, you, you have a function f. So f in our case was this addition. Right, all that's what that's all what it did. Right, and we have an initial value. Right, let's say i is the initial value, and if you have the empty list, then we saw that i was to i was the value which had to be taken. Right, so that is like if you were summing and uh, summing the elements in an empty list. You wouldn't want anything other than zero to be its value, right? So that's the initial value. And if you have fold R of f, let's say i of a list x colon x s, right? So this is a standard uh, notation for a list, right? X is the head of the list and x s is the tail of the list, right? So what you do is f x, and then you again apply fold R to the remaining part of the list, right? That's fold R. I x right. I hope it. Yeah, I think I got this right. right? So that's what that's what you do. So now with this, this simplifies our life much much uh, a lot, right? So if you want the sum of elements of a list, right? So it's just if you have a list, say my list. So that's just going to be your fold R. Uh, this plus function uh, with an initial value of zero. Remember the accumulator we started with value zero, right? And my list. Right, so this is like one one thing about folder and folder. As you can see, the type is rather that's something which is also interesting to see. So, what does folder take? It starts with a function, right, and then it takes in an initial value, and then it takes in a list, right, and it gives out another value, right. Recall again, the value which it takes is the same as this what it outputs, right. So folder, what it takes, it, it, it first takes in a function, right? So let's worry about what the type of the function is a bit later, right? So let's say the initial value, the values of type B, okay? And let's say the list x colon x s is of type list A, right? And what it gives out is, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, right. So is a value of type B, right? That's what it gives, right? So now we need to worry about what type of this particular function is, right? So the type of this function is so you can see here it takes in uh, x as input. Right? The first input to f is x, and what is the type of x? X is of type A, and it takes in this again folder i x s, right? So here this comes out to be b arrow b, right? So we we anyways want this b here, right? We want the output of f to be b. And this B once again, you can trace it by how fold R is being computed, right? And so this is about fold R. And you have another version of fold R, which is called fold R one, right? 
the folder one you use it when you really cannot assign any particular value to the uh, empty list or to the initial condition right so in the summation case we had a nice um a nice value to assign to the initial condition that is like sum of an empty list is uh, zero right so but we really cannot do this for uh, some other uh, like say we want the maximum element of the list right so it really doesn't make sense to assign a particular value to the maximum uh, uh, element of an empty list right that really does not make sense so this is where folder one comes to the rescue right and finally we see what old list right So fold L again. I'll just maybe like just define it. So if you have a, a, a function f and initial value i and an empty list, so by definition it has to be i. And if you have fold L of say a, a function again, initial value and some x colon x, right? So all this is going to be fold L uh, is going to be f. right so this is what is going to be so the main difference between these two is that fold r operates from right to left right so that is like if you have a list of uh, let's say you have some list like this right so let's say x1 uh, let's say this is a list right so if you have a list like this then what fold r does it first takes this and then comes to xn minus 1 xn minus 2 and all the way up to x2 x right but fold l it what what it does is goes from left to right right so it first operates on x1 and then operates on x2 and so on right so a rather really uh, when i was studying this like this example from uh, stack exchange really clarified my doubts so uh, like maybe i'll just leave it out as an exercise again so think about what happens to the following function right so fold r Minus. So minus is the operation I'm using. I'm not using plus because it is commutative and all that. So, um, right. So if I start with minus, I take an empty list and let's say one, two, three, right. And this example is from stack exchange, right. So I'll start with this. Think about what this guy does, right. And what about fold L of the same form, right. so think about uh, what these two give as output right so uh, just just to ensure that you have got your answer correct so maybe i'll just write it out here so what this does is 1 minus of 2 minus of 3 minus of 0 right this is what fold r computes right but what fold l computes is something which is rather different what this computes is this is hard to type so this computes 0 minus 1 and then it takes a minus 2 Right, and then ultimately it takes minus three. Right, so recall here that this zero is basically the initial value, and what fold L is doing is it operates the list from left to right. Right, so you have a zero minus one here, and the result of zero minus one you're applying it, you're applying two to it. So zero minus one minus two, right, and that you're doing minus three. But when when you're doing it for fold R, what you're doing? you can think of this zero instead of being here it's here right so you do 3 minus 0 and then you do 2 minus of 3 minus 0 and you do 1 minus of 2 minus of 3 minus 0 and that is what is giving you the output right so uh, this this is something like it really helped uh, me understand what uh, this uh, what this folder folder uh, business is right um so maybe another uh, nice exercise here uh, would be the following um okay so i uh, think about what happens to fold r of the following function so i think you have studied uh, this lambda definition so uh, let's say you have a function uh, right so recall again that this lambda what it takes is it it takes in how many ever argument to the input and the output is specified by the following So uh, x colon, um, let's say uh, x plus y colon y, right? So I'll just explain you what this means. So what this means is that uh, this this function. So re remember, fold l fold r requires a function as the first argument, right? So the function I'm giving as the first argument is the following, okay? 
and the function takes in two arguments as input one is some something x is something and the second is a list right what it does is it appends sorry not appends it prepends x then x plus y and then y colon y s right so that is what this does think about what happens to this when it is applied with an initial value of 0 to the list 0 9 okay think about what happens to this is what would be the output of this right so that that may be a, a good uh, exercise to think about right and another thing which i think you really should convince yourself this is something which uh, you really should convince yourself uh, is that how fold l and fold r operate right so remember uh, so this is just i put zero here for heuristic right so uh, ideally it should be like syntactically it should be here but i think personally i think it would make more sense if it were on the right right so convince yourself of the difference between uh, fold l and fold r and where you could possibly use it right so maybe a little bit more a far test example would be to try uh, sorting a function using fold l or fold r right so read about what is called insertion sort i think you would have done it in your lectures right so read about what is called insertion sort and uh, maybe try writing up a code for what you could possibly do for it with uh, uh, either one of fold l or uh, fold r right um, this is uh, one thing and ultimately like we can come to um, right so then there are like a couple of more uh, functions which you can use to manipulate lists right for example you can do uh, 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 what is called a zip with right so what does zip with do and this switch to gets here you know right. okay i'll just import it i'll dot list for the sake of it so, Uh, important data at least um right so what does zip with do so what zip with does is it takes in a function so let's just take uh, uh let's say zip with uh, let's say plus of say let's say two list one dot dot and let's say 20 dot dot 30. okay so what this does is you you have this list one two three all the way up to infinity right and you have another list 20 21 22 all the way up to 30 right so what this does is it basically combines these two lists using this operation which you have specified right so it does 1 plus 20 as the first element 2 plus uh, 21 as the second element 3 plus 23 as the third element and so on right and it stops when one of the list is exhausted so it should be i think 11 plus 30 11 plus 30 will give you 41 that is where this uh, whole computation stops right that's what zip with is right and so you can figure out from here the type type is something which is interesting to think about again right and next thing what is uh, uh, in line with this is what is called the zip function right so what zip does is it basically uh, just combines the two lists together right so for example if i have uh, let's say zip of let's say one two three and i say another list a um, b okay so if i have a list like this all what it does is it combines these two together into a tuple right that is exactly what uh, zip does okay and uh, that is uh, that's a little bit about zip and so these are like majorly the functions which you use for manipulating lists in uh, haskell right and so yeah, I think these these are more or less all the uh, uh, all the things that I had to say. And if there are any questions, uh, definitely do reach out to us in the discussion forum, and we'll be happy to answer them. So, and yeah, so th thanks for joining again. Bye. So you can stop the stream now. Okay.